it's like an addiction. You are addicted to that person, especially if it's a long relationship. And there is a withdrawal, right? Just like coffee and cigarettes, um, there is a withdrawal. And yeah, you just got a whole space for that. It's not going to feel so nice, but you got a whole space for that. Um, yeah. And then after that first phase, you kind of start analyzing if you want, hopefully without, um, without strong emotions, maybe even with playfulness, kind of make a plan for what you want to do to, to grow from this. Uh, and if you do that, you will find the next person, you know, and they will be even more compatible for you. Right. And that relationship will probably and hopefully be more powerful than the last one. Cause now you're, you've learned a lot about yourself and what you want, you know? Um, and I guess that's, that's the way that's the path. All right. So this is the first exclusive dialogues that we're getting into for the dojo. And I want to start off with a very big topic, the topic of love. And I'm joined by my gracious high existence team, Eric Brown, Michael Adam, MK for short, and Mike Slavin. So the first question, and this is directed at Mike Slavin, is going to be on the topic of self-love. Say you're on a, a retreat or you're in a kind of a spiritual space and you hear someone come up to you and they say something like, You've just got to love yourself, bro. You just got to love yourself more. It's all about self-love. Self-love is key. What is your initial reaction to that? You know, do you like how how do you uh, interpret that? Like, what do you think of self-love, and what do you think self-love means to most spiritual people? Hmm. Well, I think that there's. That advice, like that kind of delivery of advice, I think often will fall on deaf ears. Um, it's just, it's just not, it's not the way to communicate it. It's like, oh, well, oh, that's it. Oh, it's that easy. Well, thanks for telling me that. It's like, of course you want to love yourself more. I think the actual arriving at, you know, greater self love is a bit more difficult, a bit more challenging. And that has to do with, like, m part of my approach would be investigating with that person where they already love things in their life, you know, and, and deeply, like um, almost unconditionally. And I think some of the best ways to, to investigate this is looking at, you know, love towards pets or love towards, um, you know, children that they have in their life, things like that. Things that are like the love is so deep and all encompassing that it's like, wow. So when you already have an example of the way that you are loving towards something in your life and you can see the gap between your the love that you have for yourself versus how you love that other thing, then you can start to see, well, why why don't I feel like I deserve that same kind of love? And you can you know investigate that more deeply. I mean, that's sort of just taking my first swing of the bat. This is what mm. comes up for me. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, so building on that, I think the, 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 the emphasis on this in spiritual circles and healing circles is that a lot of us don't carry this self-love in the same way that we might love pets or children or, or best friends. So, E.B., why do you think that a lot of us don't love ourselves? You know, this is kind of str this is actually strange to like the Dalai Lama who couldn't quite understand how you could be compassionate to other people but not yourself. It's like, how, how does that work? Why do you think we have that disease or issue in, in the West. Conditioning and identity, basically. <laughs> Conditioning, external, identity, internal. Um, I mean, there may be a level of simplification to this, but in essence, I think you're often habituated into a toxic relationship with yourself as you grow up. Mm. You're literally either directly or indirectly told that in several several major categories of your life from relationship to work to careers to uh, physical image like basically all the core categories that encompass your sense of self you're just never good enough at and you habitualize that over time you actually condition it and given that 
it's not unreasonable that people come to the conclusion of what about myself is lovable given that all of me is awful. Uh, I think a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of people come to that point and I can see why, because you're just so everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, all the figures of authorities you grow up in some way often send you the signal of, man, you're just not quite there yet. I wouldn't stop yet. And that, that little thread of like you're not quite there yet, you haven't reached the lovable worthiness threshold, is the identity part, the internal part of uh, why people have a yeah toxic relationship to their own worthiness and their own love, which is there's something of you don't expect something that you love to change. You don't require it to do anything. It is complete, worthy of love completely satisfactory in and of itself as it is if you applied that to you a lot of people i think would lose a majority of their motivation to do things their almost charisma because they don't have to act for people anymore to get their approval and certainly a a wide gamut of their own identity and that's actually extremely conflicting Right, you don't want to give up your the drive that has carried you so far, but the drive only really came about so that you could earn the level of love. So there's this very strange like um, paradox where you almost don't want to love yourself because it would actually lead to uh, degradation of some things that have become core identity pillars for you, things like hustle things like work, things like output, things like competitiveness. Often, I think, if people investigate, are rooted very, very deeply in an attempt to become the person worthy of love. And if you just suddenly were, uh, all of that would go away. So, yeah, mm. conditioning and identity, I think, are the huge core final gatekeepers of your own level of self-love. In the Inner Critic series that I did... Um, I refer to like a double standard where we treat ourselves differently from how we treat other people often. So why do you think that we hold ourselves accountable to like achieving all these different things, but then we don't hold the people that we love, the external people that we love accountable to the same things before we love them? You know, like why do we have to achieve all this worldly success before we can love ourselves, but we don't require the same from our friends and children? It might actually be worth starting that with investigating whether or not you do require that from people. Mm -hmm. Some people um, do. I, yeah, I think it's. I think that's far more subtle than imagined. Um, I think the. Mm, there's a there's an incompleteness thing here. You only have access to. You only have access to what you can see on the surface of people and whatever you're willing to ask them. And there's a level of totalness that you get from that just because it's all you have access to. You get the full picture that they're willing to convey to you. The You have far more access into your own inner life and you can actually notice a lot of the ways that you would consider yourself incomplete. And so it's just that distance between what you can see and what you hold yourself to that I think roots a lot of that um, sows the seeds of that double standard. Mm -hmm. Nicely put. Something that comes up to me also because of the inner critic and, and like internal family systems, <clears throat> I think there's a different balance between like how people talk to you and how people talk to other people around you, you know? And then people talk to you in a certain way. You learn how to talk to yourself in that way. But then people also talk to others Right. And I think that you're learning to talk to others more like in the way that these people around you, parents, friends, family, teachers talk to others. So you might be dealt, be dealt with differently. You know, um, maybe you're loved less or you were taught to behave in a way that is not really healthy and more toxic to you, but less toxic to others. And then that snowballs. 
you can become then very kind to others, but very toxic to yourself because of these different balances and games that are happening around you, right? And then, yeah, that's why when people start, like you're hanging out in a good environment, you know, that balance shifts to like with yourself, but might not shift as much with others, you know? So it's also a very interesting part of this. Yeah, I think this goes very like deeply into, as Eric brought up in like, it was like his first or second word around the like, conditioning. And I think about like people's issues with self-love often have to do with their, the way they internalize a caretaker, like how their parents related to them or older figure, um, how they learn from them about how they should act, you know, based on how they were treated and, and then they're also learned from them how they should treat other people. And this is related to what, what Mike is saying. So, oh, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to treat these people nicely. Like it's part, part of its social incentives. Like you don't want to be seen as being cruel, but if you're cruel to yourself, no one can see it. So there's like, are there other people going to like shame you for being, you know, that kind of person? So a lot of, I think, gaps in self-love have to do with an inadequately developed uh, internal caretaker. People don't know how to appropriately, appropriately relate to themselves uh, from that from that place of like stewarding themselves and growing. It's like, yes, you have flaws. Your flaws don't make you imperfect. And it more, more becomes like they're borrowing their worth from some idealized future self. And if they just stand within these parameters of like acceptable behavior, then they can still feel like they're on the direction of someday being worth the love that they have right now, but they feel they don't fully deserve something like that. So it's like they're almost indebted to some future version of themselves that will reach the pinnacle, even though it's like, that's like, it's just so exhausting to be trapped in that. Mm. Exhausting is a good word. With the, uh, I like your point, Mike, about like, we, we speak to ourselves differently because nobody can hear that. Right. Like that's a, that's a really interesting one. So one of the things I've observed and tell me if you've seen something similar is when you find someone who's very self hating, like they don't have much love towards themselves when they get into an intimate relationship with someone and that, that person loves them because they don't love themselves on some level, they then resent their partner and struggle to find their partner worthy of respect because their partner is in love with someone who's not worthy of love, right? And so like, that's when like the low self-esteem kind of negative energy can start like lashing out. Um, yeah, any, any thoughts on that kind of, you know, low self-esteem, pain body type situation in intimate relationships? I mean, I, I'm aware of, you know, this can, this can happen particularly on the, um, and this is not always the case, but it tends to be more on, on, you know, like, the, the feminine counterpart of, of a relationship where they're more preoccupied with their image and how they look. Again, this is not all like, this is not a hundred percent of the time, but I'm speaking from interactions I've seen in the past where, um, you know, and you also see like prevalence of eating disorders in women much higher, these kinds of things. There's certain cultural conditioning of a fixation on the body and how the body presents. That might have to do with the male gaze or different things. Like, I, I'm not sure. But you have this situation where someone feels like they are not in good enough shape or they, and it's like, that's disgusting that they're carrying around some extra pounds. Meanwhile, the partner thinks they're absolutely gorgeous, stunning and beautiful and expresses and communicates in that way, but it can't land because that wall of disgust that they feel towards themselves is there. And then they see like, what's wrong with this person that they think I'm like, what's wrong with them that, you know, it's like, and then it obviously, you know, that happening on a long enough timeline makes it very hard for the relationship to be, maintained and, and tenable, um, which is tragedy. Uh, it's obviously a tragedy because it's the, the, this person loves you for who you are and, and your own self judgments are keeping you from receiving that love, you know, cause it's like you're, this is where it gets into it's, it, I think part of it has to do with a foundational confusion for who you actually are. And you've confused yourself with some construct that you're interacting with cognitively when you're, you're much, who you are is much more majestic and profound than that, you know, than this idea that you've cultivated, this bundle of, of, you know, like ideas that you've wrapped up into this thing you call an identity. You know what I mean? You're so much more than that. Can we actually love someone else if we don't love ourselves or is it just uh, an illusion 
or an act of loving them? I, I think you can. And here's why I think because the, I think that love is genuine, but it's come like the, our love towards that person is coming from one aspect of ourself and our hatred is coming from a different aspect. It's like, uh, you know, towards ourselves. So we point that like it's assembly of parts and we have this really vicious, you know, like part that is mostly aimed internally, but sometimes it gets projected out in a similar pattern that we just discussed where it's like, oh, we're receiving love. Like, how could you love me? All of that stuff. But I, I do believe people can genuinely love others, even if they have a really difficult relationship with their self, because it's, you know, all they are isn't just self judgment. There are these other aspects. And it's, I think that the self judgment part is just really, really loud uh, for like in their internal landscape, it has a lot of authority in that internal landscape, in that room of, of parts, it has a lot of sway and power. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that the loving parts can't genuinely express love. Although as we were just describing, it can certainly get in the way and it can certainly make loving someone really more challenging than it needs to be. But that doesn't mean they, they aren't capable of it. That's my perspective at least. Yeah, and it would be quite unfair to discredit someone's love because they didn't love themselves, right? If they claim to love someone else deeply, then it would be quite unfair to say, hang on a second, you can't do that, right? Like, <laughs> that's, that's pretty arrogant. Uh, on, the, on the topic of, you know, compliments not landing, talk about a classic relationship self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, like, after a while, giving compliments to someone who doesn't accept them at a certain point, you'll probably stop, right? At which point that will be confirmation that I'm not worthy of compliments, right? So that's fascinating. Uh, this is a, to switch topics a little bit, EB, you are someone who expresses love to people a lot. You know, like, I love you. What's up? Love you. You know, like you say the words love you quite a lot. I think, we, you know, we all do to varying degrees. What is going through your mind when you say that? Like, is that sort of just like a another way of saying like i care about you and how do you differentiate between saying i love you in you know in the most profound mystical sense that you know i love you versus a more ca kind of casual sense you know do you use different kind of language like how, how how do you i struggle with this one you know i want to keep it sacred but i also want to express love towards everyone right so like how do you how do you make sense of that Damn. Uh, I mean, quite frankly, I'm trying to figure it out. That's the place to start with that answer. There is, this sounds super cliche, but it is reasonably, it's, it's a genuine part of what prompts it for me a lot, which is, uh, it's kind of two things, I guess. One is there's a gross lack of the expression of love in culture, like, period. Same thing with physical touch, like, we're completely starved for physical touch. I, I think I think it's changing, but I think historically, like men have not received there's a there's actually a joke online you can see sometimes where if a man receives a compliment, he makes it part of his core personality. This joke that like men just don't receive compliments or like are told that they're worthy of love or anything. So there's a part of like just wanting to be a kind of corrective mechanism to that. Um but the other, the other kind of, yeah, it's, it's not a cliche, but it, there's a very direct reality of like, this might be the last thing you ever say to that person. What do you want it to be? Like really having it settle in that like, yeah, the next time you talk to them is not guaranteed for whatever reason. And yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, last thing I would want someone to hear from me is just, I love you. Period. Damn. Never thought about it that way, but it's it's that's like that's a very nice kind of reflection on impermanence mixed in with a beautiful <laughs> message of compassion. That's epic. Yeah, and it it can um. Damn, I I don't think I have a great answer to the balance between like frequency and sacredness, like how to actually make sure that it retains its weight. Um. I mean, there's a part of me that is like at baseline you need to like be in person in close contact looking them in the eyes to say it that that really carries the weight but in the interim digitally facilitated relationships you know i'm going to do the best i can and just show up and be like look dude 
we just had a whole conversation good bad ugly whatever like dude i love you i miss you talk soon i think that it's a spectrum even when you say i love you because you can say love you bye or i love you and it's more about the energy that you you know transmit rather than the words i, I really felt that, that second one man <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I also say I love you a lot. It's usually just because I think even if I say it with the lower frequency or energy, it's still like, I like you, you know, I hope I wish you well, I care for you. And uh, it's also easier to just use this, this one word rather than like, uh, try to figure. And um, yeah, so it keeps the sacredness because when you really say it, people feel it, you know, it, it doesn't take away from it if you say it more often with the with the lower energy. I have a, a round table question for each of you. Uh, it's a big one, so no pressure. Um, but you, you sometimes encounter different definitions of love, like, you know, the, the full spectrum of different personality types might have a different interpretation of love, right? You know, you might have, you know, someone who's more in a, like a top, like a toxic relationship might say like, I love my partner. Um, but they've got to do what I say, you know, and then you might have someone on another end of the spectrum. That's like, I love my partner. They can go and be free and I won't, you know, I won't restrict them in any way. You know, that is true love. So as a basic working definition, how would you describe healthy love? You know, like the, the optimal state of love. Like, how do you know when you're expressing healthy love? Um, and we'll do EB, Mike Slavin, MK. That's I got some time to think about it. <laughs> Yo, yeah, you put me on the spot with that one. Okay. Dang. Um, wow. Uh, something like genuine... Ah, I don't want to say love, like... Um, genuine compassion for the other person that doesn't come at the expense of your own that doesn't transgress your own boundaries because it's very easy i mean i'm i'm actually glad you asked like healthy love versus just love period yeah. love period would have gotten way more way more abstract but yeah to me the healthy one is uh i fall back on the classic um airline oxygen mask metaphor in a lot of the work we do which is like it is a principle to take care of yourself before you even think you can effectively take care of someone else this was also the can you love someone else um before without loving yourself question and it's like look if you are doing anything that violates your own boundaries or would actually cause you to love yourself less um there's nothing healthy about that dynamic and actually continuing on that will habitualize something you probably don't want to be habitualized. Um, so yeah, like selfless action and emotion for another person that does not violate core parts of you, your values, your boundaries. I think it's mostly just not violating yourself and you can be fairly honest with yourself fairly quickly about that, I think, um, whether something is like in integrity and in alignment with your own actions. Um, and then, yeah, beyond that, you know, sky's the limit at that point. Thanks for that. All right. I was, um, yeah, hoping that some insight and brilliance would strike me while Eric was talking, but I was too captivated by what he was sharing to even give myself a chance to, you know, think of my response. So uh, I'm just going to spitball because I think there's something here that has to do with receptivity for me. You know, like stonewalling feels like real antithetical to the spirit of love. So there has to be some degree of like receptivity, some, some openness, you know, even in the face of really difficult emotions. Um, I think there's the extension of good faith. Like this is an important piece. You have to like trust that the person is like, they're not trying to deceive you or manipulate you. And they're showing up earnestly to interact with you and, and you're doing the same. So like that has to be like 
the basis. There can't be like this one upmanship or, you know, like because you're so hurt or the other person's so hurt, you're trying to like take shots at one another. That can happen, of course, in like really heated emotional situations, but it can't, um, there has like, that can't become the like modus operandi of the relationship, obviously. And so with healthy love, I think it has a lot to do with, you know, like I think Eric was touching on something really vital because there are situations in which people will really sort of think that love is going above and beyond for the other person. And in doing so, they like go past their own like capacity and, and, that that's where the seeds of resentment get sown. And you really have to be careful that those weeds don't get planted in like the garden of your love because then they start to take over and then all the attention goes on trying to deal with those things rather than dealing with like the actual love flowing between you and then it's all kinds of processing and stuff like that. So I think – hmm, yeah. And this also puts – it's like it makes me think – I feel like we have – limitations in English with the word love. Cause I'm like, well, there, there's different subtleties in romantic love than there is with my friends and with my family. And they're like, there's all kinds of differences that I, you know, but I think broadly speaking, um, you know, there's a, there's a receptivity. There's also an extension of like, um, yeah, like we can't, we can't be so, have our standards so high that other people aren't able to be human. I mean, we have to give them space to be human beings and to mess up and be capable of forgiveness. I think forgiveness is, is a, a big part of it as well. Now that is an unending forgiveness. If you keep getting hurt in similar ways, or you really don't feel like this is, this dynamic is good for you in whole and on, you know, in the, in the long run, then you have to make other decisions. But I think there is like space for humanity. Um, to, to live there for both of us, because if you can't give someone else space to be human and they're, well, they're, they have no incentive to, to reflect that space back to you. And then it feels very like tight and like, I got to be completely on point. I can't ever mess up in certain ways, you know, and then that doesn't feel safe because you're going to mess up and you have to have that safety to mess up. So those are some of my, my initial thoughts. A lot of wisdom here. <clears throat> um, I really like the word capacity and boundaries. They connect very well as well. So I just agree with you both, uh, generally speaking, uh, going to my own narrative to give examples that are relevant for me that might change. But for now, it's like, I feel like these things, like my, my love kind of depend on them. I'm not yet at fully like loving unconditionally. Uh, hopefully I am on the Ram Dass path, but not there yet. Um, for now, it's like they have to know my capacity and be willing to listen to it, respect it, right? And even if sometimes it means like a small sacrifice because I maybe can't be heard because uh, I can't listen to them right now, but only later um, or the opposite. So that's one thing, my capacity and everyone has a different capacity, but I think that's so important. If they can't read my capacity and we keep like, that's basically crossing boundaries, right? If they can't read it, they'll cross boundaries. Um, and that would just hurt both of us and create negative cycles and make loving harder. So that's one big thing, boundaries, capacity. Um, what else? The second, the second thing is, I'd love to be like celebrated when I win. And of course, vice versa. No jealousy there. That can be very toxic, you know, because that like automatically brings you down. And when I am struggling, failing, when I fall, I'd like to get supported as well. So like support has to be there all the time. Sometimes less, sometimes more, you know, maybe my partner has less capacity to support right now. And that's okay because I, I, I feel their capacity. So now my expectation kind of moves with it. Interesting. Yeah. So kind of like the expectation has to, to flow with the, the level of capacity at all times. Otherwise, you know, we, we, we heard the expectation. We heard the relationship. And, um, and then one more thing that came up for me, and that's only in romantic relationships is chemistry. There has to mm -hmm. be some kind of chemistry. 
Because if there is no attraction or chemistry at all, you know, then it's kind of like the spectrum of love. Or like it's, it's more than just spectrum. But I feel like there is something missing, you know, mm-hmm. because a part of being this ape is fulfilling that need, unless maybe you're Ramdas. Um, and actually, it's interesting because many of the many, some of the gurus actually had some some dark stuff when it comes to romantic relationships, because maybe they had a big gap there in their path on their path. And then that kind of drove their ape mind crazy and made them do things that, um, yeah, were not on the path. Yeah, so these are the the few that came up for me. And you, John? Yeah. So just touching on that quickly, there's a meditation teacher, Larry Rosenberg. He wrote a book called Breath by Breath. And he said that things like fame and money and sex had very powerful energies associated with them. They were, they, they could pose problems to people and the monastics figured out a solution to these, to this problem. And that is just to drop them all. Right. So like, that's one solution to that problem, get rid of them. (laughs) Um, but like a more difficult question is like, how do you live with them with these really powerful energies? And that's like a really tricky thing. And like, even like people that are pretty awake or meditate a lot can still struggle with that. Um, I've been thinking about definitions of love and thinking about Oliver, my son, and I thought about this scene from the movie As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson in, and he's like a kind of a grumpy character in it, and there's a scene in the the movie where he's sitting next to this this woman, and the woman's affectionate toward him, and he's like, I got a compliment for you, you make me take my pills. And she's like, how is that a compliment? And he's like, because after meeting you, I want to be a better person. Right. And like, that's like the, like a beautiful, and there's something to that. Like love is in some ways, and it ties into like having your own standards as well as it can be inspirational. Like I want to be better so I can create a better environment for this person that I love, you know, and that can like spread out, you know, I want to be better. I want to make the world better for the person that I love. Um, so that's like, it's not like a comprehensive definition of love, but there's something in there that I, that I like. Um, I want to ask MK a question. You've been in a a relationship for a a while now. I don't know exactly how long. There's a line that I love from Tal Ben-Shahar, positive psychologist. And I listened to his lectures and he said that true love begins where movies end. And I'm wondering, does that resonate with you? And what do you think about that? that quote it's interesting because is it like a movie in the cinema or an activity like that or is it talking about any journey you know that ends any goal that is achieved yeah so i think um you know like when you watch titanic right which like you know a romance story i think like the the whole love story between the two main main characters in titanic was like a two-week love story Right. And it's beautiful and it's gorgeous and, you know, it's, it's emotional, but it's two weeks. Right. So like you're wondering, like, what are they like as a couple two years later when they've got to do taxes and cook food mm. and there's arguments and stuff like that. So I guess Tal ben is talking about the difference between infatuation and lust versus like a deep, loving friendship, like a friendship on fire. So like that's what he means when like true love, not just infatuation, true love begins where the movies typically end, like the, the romance movies end. Amazing definition. Uh, yeah, I. it feels to me like it is in the day-to-day, it is in the little things, it is acting like a little kid, you know, while working in the same room or just by passing by and trying to make it fun and lovely. It is in the darkness and difficulty. You know, and holding space for each other, making that sacrifice that maybe right now I am also a bit like unbalanced, uncentered, but but my partner needs more of me than I need. You know, I've got the mask. She doesn't. So I'm going to help her now. And even though I wanted to do something else, um, it is in expression, you know, not keeping secrets. You know, making the other person feel like this, the space is safe and there's nothing they might fear of, you know, because we tend to, to think about possible 
um, possible negative outcomes sometimes when we have gaps. You know, why, you know, why did she, you know, have that energy now? You know, uh, why did that happen? And then when we close those gaps, it's usually, unless we're very secure with ourselves, you know, it's usually <laughs> causing some, some misalignment or, or some negativity in us, right? So that's just like a, a great cure for that expressing all the time uh, and not keeping secrets um, and making sure that we're on the same page. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting for me, like many of the most amazing moments in our partnership, at least our relationship are just the day to day, those playful small moments and um, the ordinary things. And I really agree with that basically because what actually um, dictates if the relationship is great or not is after the movie. <laughs> Are they just fighting all the time because right now there is no like uh, ecstasy or whatever, or, uh, a, an epic quest to go through, you know, that they have to unite for. And, and they're just like struggling and, and it's kind of dark and, uh, and they're maybe, you know, just together because of the marriage or the contract. Or are they actually together because they're choosing to be together for those little moments? Because after all, you know, we spend most of the time, you know, together with our partners, not in those epic journeys. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that speaks to, like, it's a really sad thing that people have the expectation that it'd be like this movie and it can feel like that, like a movie at the beginning. Like there's this excellent chart in the book, the happiness hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt, where he shows these lines of uh, like passionate and companionate love. And when you first fall in love with someone, the, the chemical spike is serious. Like it's a real serious chemical spike that inevitably drops off. It inevitably drops off. And it, there's this weird danger zone where it's dropping off, but the companionate love hasn't yet, like, really sort of beca become the foundation. And that's that's a precarious position in which people can, you know, that sort of part ways because they think something is wrong. They diagnose the relationship as well. It doesn't feel like it did when we first got together. So of course now it it means that this, and it's like no, this is how it goes. This is what happens. We acclimate to our experiences. And, you know, like we have to be able to love each other in the mundane. Like that is what makes up our life anyway. These mundane moments, like people like to chase peak experiences. I love peak experiences as well, but they only take up like a few frames on the film reel of the, the whole arc of your life. And yet you have to be able to love those, those ordinary moments, you know? So it's a great prompt, John. Thanks. Yeah. I love that line. It really got me thinking. So we've kind of covered some some of the kind of nicer aspects of love, you know, like love is a, a force for good and it feels amazing. The dark side of love, and this is the risky part, is potentially unreciprocated love. You know, and this can be extremely painful. You know, like people have, have taken their own lives because of failed relationships and infidelity and things like that right there's like when you love someone the all of the things that make it great when it's taken from you make it extremely difficult so another round table and um i'm gonna have to start with ueb because um mk and mike spoke last <laughs> so we'll do eb mk and mike <clears throat> what advice would you give to someone who feels love towards someone else right and this is big this could be a romantic interest this could be even a child who's like estranged or something, or like a family member who, who deeply loves someone, but that love is unreciprocated and it's causing them pain. Damn. First thing I would say is I've been on both ends of this. I have been both the person where it wasn't reciprocated and I have several times been the one where I was not reciprocating to the person. Mm. So First thing I would say is I feel you. It fucking is really hard. <laughs> Don't bypass the feelings. Sit with them. Um, all right. Beyond that, I guess there are, there are several general ones that are very difficult to swallow in the moment, but uh, eternally important to to bring back and are probably helpful for the 
forward motion after that. Uh, one is as difficult as it sounds, it's never a reflection on you, right? Other people are allowed to have their own preferences. And if you love people enough to give them their own preferences, that has to include the fact that it might, they might not prefer you. Like not easy, but, um, a very foundational, nearly basic point there, which is just like, look, that's just not you or whatever the dynamic is. It's just not in their path, program, DNA, preference, flavor. And that's actually okay. That's actually okay. Um, there's a very, this is actually one of the things I've never myself like practiced or explored a direct experience of polyamory but it's one of the things i respect about that space a lot the sentiment i get that if you truly loved a person you would want whatever is best for them whatever makes them happy even if that is not you and that is a very confronting thing but if you're if your love is and care and compassion is genuine it has to include the reality that um what's best or what's preferred for them might not include you. Um, those, those are similar, but different, right? It's not a reflection of you and give the, give the other person the grace to do exactly what they want and how they feel. Um, the very classic cliche of there are other fish in the ocean, right? I'm, I'm both like very much on the side and very far away from the idea that there's literally only one person out there for you. Like on one hand, I think there are a class of qualities that definitely uh, fit in to your lock the best. But at the same time, like before you met that person, they were a stranger. You may have walked past them several million times and never known. Um, yeah, the idea that it can't happen again or the idea that, you know, you're now you've uh, missed the only train, I think is just extremely untrue and. I guess the last point is just like um it's it's the ephemeral nature of everything just like Mike was just sharing around the the chemical spike um when you get into a relationship I mean that the gutting feeling of it also fades and you can actually get to a space in reflection where it's like ah you know I'm actually glad that happened because it actually showed me how deeply I could care about things how much I could love people again and at the end of the day, that's a very good reminder to have. And so you can even come to a point of uh, grace and gratefulness for even that experience, which is as painful as many emotional experiences can get. All right. Eric's uh, has the joy of doing this interview on hard mode because <laughs> he doesn't get the, you know, I, I get to work off of all this like material that he's he's dumped on us, and he's just got a, he's got a riff. Next time, I'll take hard mode, Eric, if you want. But um, but I love a lot of that um, that expression and some of the man. There's so much that I could say around this. Um, hmm. One of the words that come up for me is agency. It's like if I truly love someone, I have to respect their choices. If they don't want to be with me, and I can't accept that then like I can't accept their, their I can't accept this like really important choice that they're making that they feel is like the right thing for them. Like, do I really love them or do I love the idea of being with them? And I can't overcome this, like these broke, like the, the, like I'm unable to grieve this lost future. So I feel so like incomplete. And, and so I think there's something about self-esteem here. We need to feel like, um, like this person isn't our, like we, we are our own individuals. They do not complete us, you know, like that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Of course it hurts. This is so important. This is something that's super important to you. So this is another thing is I think people don't know how to grieve properly. This is one of my, you know, sort of the, one of the drums that I beat a lot, but you know, if you can properly grieve this thing and you, you recognize that way, well, Hey, it was all always already ephemeral. It was going to end at some point. If you're walking around thinking these things aren't going to end, um, then, you know, wake up. Like, it's going to end in one way or another on some some timeline. It's ending. Okay? Appreciate it while you have it. Like, it's going to end sometime. And so when, when it does end, you can grieve it in such a way that the value of the relationship becomes, like, 
etched into you so that you take, you take this with you and move forward and take that love with you. You carry it with you, you know, you like revere it and honor it for what it was. And you can continue singing the song that they were singing in your life, you know, that you've learned from them. And I think that's a really beautiful way of processing it. The alternative is to like writhe around, which sometimes early on you're, you're going to writhe and it's going to be really difficult, but, and then try and make all these gestures to, to win them back. And, and it can like this kind of neediness um, is like, can be extremely unattractive. It's like, that's not what you want to do. Um, it's like, you have to respect someone's decision. You know what I mean? Trying to, and, and another thing people might do is just like try to generate sympathy like, but look how sad I am. Look how much you've hurt me. Like that is going to be like a really welcome invitation for them to come back into your life. Like that's like coercing them in some sense because they feel like I've uh, like if I make them realize how much they've hurt me, then then maybe they'll come walking back into my life. But then now they're under this they're under this pretense that they would be a bad person if they weren't with you. Like uh, that's like not really the foundation or the ground you want to build on, right? So I think that there's this. There's this processing that, that needs to happen. There's the grieving of, of the loss. And, and from there, you know, you can, there's a lot of, like, you can walk through this life not being, like, uh, closed-hearted. Because I think that's another thing that happens. When, when ultimately that fails, like, all those gestures and effort to bring the person back fails, then the person closes their heart. And they stop believing in love. They stop believing in the possibility of love. Um, and it's like, it doesn't have to be that way, you know? I think a lot of this, yeah, it, this inflames our flaws, the ways that we feel like we're we're bad or dirty or broken. You know, when we lose this person that was this close love source, then it, it can be really difficult and challenging. And I think another thing that's hard for men, I mean, it's hard for, for men and women, absolutely. But I think at least platonic touch among women is more acceptable. So you like for a lot of men, they have this, like this person, this romantic partner is literally their access point to human touch. And then they lose that. And now they're just isolated. They don't, they don't, they're like, cause they're, they, maybe they'll have a pat on the back from a friend. You know what I mean? But the, there's a lot more sort of um, resistance around platonic touch for, for men. So they like, comp so then uh, now their body feels this weird sense of alienation, you know, it's like on a, on a very animal level, like, Oh no, I'm alone. You know what I mean? So that's another thing that can be really hard. And, and that has to do with like our culture. So there's a lot of cultural issues that, that I think this, this surfaces, but that that's the, what, what comes up for me. I think I would say that it's really hard, you know, losing someone that you love is really hard and it's messy and get, get cut yourself some slack because it's hard to, to learn from it. But there is a path to honoring and grieving and learning from everything and you're worthy of love and you can find someone else. And maybe this is part of your journey that you need to have some time for yourself and f figure out who you are in a way because you merged with this thing and now you need to disentangle and, you know, discover that. And that could be a really beautiful process. So it's like, wow, this is exciting. Hell yeah. You're going to like, now you're like, this is a part of your story. Like go and experience this part of your story. You're going to run into another stranger someday who you fall in love with very likely. So that's my riff. I have so much to work with. <laughs> Overwhelming. And yeah, I'll start by saying it's like the third time, but I think it's very important that feeling the sadness is so important. Cry, grieve. It, it just has to happen and it might take longer than you expect. Just kind of like even don't put, you know, a window on it, like a duration on it. Even if it takes months, just let it happen. Usually it takes longer because people are attached to something, you know, or people don't allow it. And that actually makes the emotion not go through fully and stay longer. And the cycle um, gets longer too. So feel it, be with it. It is sad. There are many, may maybe beautiful memories um, or maybe visions you had if you, it wasn't a relationship and you wanted it. It was an idea. But yeah, just like feel it really. Hold space for yourself. 
because you maybe you had an expectation it was broken just like a, a kid that really wanted that ice cream and then it didn't freaking get it and it's like crying you know but just way way more intense maybe um so that's one um and that will also like like very beautiful things will come out of that space you, you might strengthen the relationship with yourself maybe that was required because the reason why the relationship didn't didn't like stay as long as you expected is because you couldn't hold that space for yourself i think that happens very very often um and then i really like to just take the approach of trying to learn from it you know so first of all it's important to respect their decision you know if it was theirs and um, to not be with you or to break up and then also it happened because you were not compatible the two of you right and a part of it is they were not compatible with you probably maybe they're too secure and they they want to some time for themselves and you were bringing them down and that means that it is you looking in the mirror and realizing oh no like or oh yes i i didn't do that well enough i'd like to improve that i'd like to be more secure confident i'd like to be able to to handle myself you know and not be as needy or dependent you know um, or attached um, and maybe and some of the things are like the compatibility is not working because they're not they were not there for you and that might help you see it more clearly right actually we were not thinking well you know we were lacking those things in common that prevented this relationship from th thriving so it's kind of like feel the sadness and let go of like trying to make things work out logically because usually that combo is very toxic if you're trying to to figure out why did it happen what did you do wrong you know and at the same time your 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 nervous system your body is just trying to, to grieve and cry out but you're just, like blocking that that that's i think making people really really feel bad and makes the cycle way worse um, because it is a chemical reaction. It's like, it's like an addiction. You were addicted to that person, especially if it's a long relationship. And there is a withdrawal, right? Just like coffee and cigarettes, um, there is a withdrawal. And yeah, you just got a whole space for that. It's not going to feel so nice, but you got a whole space for that. Um, yeah, and then after that first phase, you kind of start analyzing if you want, hopefully without... Um, without strong emotions, maybe even with playfulness, kind of make a plan for what you want to do to to grow from this. Uh, and if you do that, you will find the next person, you know, and they will be even more compatible for you, right? And that relationship will probably and hopefully be more powerful than the last one because now you're, you've learned a lot about yourself and what you want, you know, Um and I guess that's that's the way, that's the path. Um, yeah. There's some um, incredible wisdom in this. I wish I could hear you guys speak like 10 years ago. That would have been useful. <laughs> so I have a few things to share on this because I've definitely in the past had, a, had breakups and then like Googled how to get your ex back. You know, like the classic, like how to get your ex back. And I've spoken two guys who are go actually like going through that in real time. And it's like a very painful place to be. You know, it's like, it's like a super painful place to be. And, and, and I think where it comes from, when you're interested in like self-improvement and optimization, you think, right, I can like, MK, like I can get my routine perfect, take all the right supplements, like hack my biology to be as helpful as possible. Oh, there's this person who's left, who doesn't want to be with me. Can I like, can I like do the same thing there? and like get the person back. And what we've touched on in this, in this talk a little bit is like the place that something is coming from, especially with love, is everything. And when you typically first meet an individual and you fall in love and you have that, that infatuation, you're often coming from a place of inspiration. And when someone has left you and you're trying to get them back, you're trying to come at it from a place of desperation. And it's like two, like the energy between those two things are so different. 
that it like <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do. Um, and I I've had conversations with uh, I had a conversation with someone uh, who and I've been there myself. They broke up with someone and then they were they were going to meet up with their ex like a month later. And they really worked it up in their mind. Like, it's like, right, I've got to do my meditation on this day. I've got to do my cold exposure. I'm like, I'm going to show up to this meeting and really, you know, like show the best vision of myself and like get her back and live happily ever after. And it's going to be like amazing. It's going to be like a movie. But the place that that's coming from, right? It's like, it's not a place of like value offering. It's, it's in some ways, it's kind of objectification, right? Like you're objectifying someone else. Like you're not seeing the, the human there. You're not trusting their opinion. And so what I would say to someone, if I was speaking to someone in this, in this state is true maturity is being able to recognize the state that you're in and to get to a place, however it takes, to be able to say that up to that person that left, I actually can't be with you right now because I'm not in the right space for that, right? And that's like when you can do that, like that's like the the kind of Jedi, the Jedi. But you have to mean it. It's not a technique, right? You have to really mean it because it's true. Like it's true. If you're that like desperate to get some someone back like that. Perhaps you, you need a break. Like perhaps that, as MK was saying, the addiction is too strong, right? The withdrawals are too strong. You need to break from it. Yeah, I think this lends itself to like the response to want to meditate and like do all of these things. Um, that can be really a good response in, you know, in the sort of response to a life tragedy or something that's like, you know, like, damn, I'm hurting because – it, it one thing it like allows us to seize the reins on our own life, but if we're doing it so that like X thing will happen, then a lot, then it's like okay, well when that thing doesn't happen, are all of these behaviors just gonna fall fall by the wayside? It's like that's not how you want to set it up. Use that raw energy because there is a massive energy release that happens, and then like you can use that fire to like all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna like thank you for the blessing of this bomb in my life because that the explosiveness of this is going to help me cultivate myself in deeper ways. Like, thank you for that, you know, and you might not feel that way at the outset, but you, you can eventually come to that, you know, if you really follow that line through and you use, you know, the, the sort of energy that you're, that you have from that. So, um, yeah. Are you guys about ready to wrap up? I wanted to add something about this, actually. It's not only in relationships. That's why it's very important to give honest feedback to everyone, the restaurant, the partner, the friend. When you don't, you know, it just like, it just hurts everyone. They will not get that energy. They will not know what they did wrong. They will not get the feedback and then they will not grow. And yeah, for some people, it might mean some darkness, you know, and, and then they'll need support. So maybe the best thing is to tell the truth and then also be there for like whenever you can be there for them. But a lot of the the horrible things that are happening in the world are coming from the lack of dishonesty and feedback, I think. And that just allows for like a negative feedback loops or basically false positive feedback loops. Like, oh, everything is okay. But in reality, you got to change that. And no one tells you because they're trying to be nice. Yeah. So... And I, I think with that said, it's important to recognize that people's feedback is not objective. They're reporting on their own experience that like to the best of their ability, just because they give you some feedback doesn't necessarily mean what they're saying is like true about you. It can be speaking to their own experience. So I think it's important for people to, you know, it's like take everything with a grain of salt because other people are wrestling with their own demons. And it's like, you're that you're not enough of this or you're not enough of that. And I was like, well, I never claimed to be that. And you still like, you know, you were here all this time before that. Like what happened? You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, well, you know, this and that. So I think that's, I agree though. I think there's this huge honesty is so essential, right? I mean, I feel like that's the, 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 the main, the main piece that I'm hearing from what you just expressed, Mike, you know, yeah, to the best of our ability. Thank you for softening that. Of course, always the, the rule the rule beneath that is make sure it's within their capacity, right? And make sure to be kind while giving the feedback, right? So don't just like walk around fucking 
<laughs> you're doing that wrong. You're doing that wrong. You're horrible. <laughs> yeah, that might cause some disruption in a person's life. But I think heartfelt, like earnest, you know, and I, it's all, it's all, I think reporting on our own experience to keep the other person in the loop rather than like, these are the ways you need to change. You know, for me to be satisfied with you, like that, for, that subtlety is like super important. Um, cause if you go around, you need to be this way, you need to be, it's like, oh man, I, this is like, I'm going to be around this, you know? I want to make a, make a note for the viewers. Um, so like normally you listen to a podcast and there's no real way you can interact with the, the, the people on, on the podcast, but if there's it, like, this is exclusive for the dojo. So if there's anything that you want clarification on anything you loved about this, anything you didn't understand, anything you want to just share yourself, there's going to be a comment section. So yeah, let us know. Let's keep the dialogues uh, going and continuing. Uh, they don't have to end here. Awesome. And, and with that said, thank you so much guys. Looking forward to doing more of these in-depth discussions with you. The next one I want to do is going to be on death and impermanence. So, yeah. oh, oh, that's going to be a good one. <laughs> yeah. That's a big one. Yeah, we only do big things, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for facilitating, John. And great job, Eric. You, you, I think you did hard mode with, you know, <laughs> flying colors. Adversity is a privilege. <laughs> Yeah, I can't unmute my mic. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Yeah, this was amazing. This was amazing. Thank you. <laughs>